Praise God. We serve a good God. Amen. Why don't you take your seat, smile at somebody this morning. Fantastic. Thank you, Mary and Izzy, everybody for leading us today. We finish our series on courage this morning. I trust you've enjoyed as we journeyed through the start of the year, really, and I trust that your courage, that secret ingredient has risen in your heart, that courage to step out from where you've been, to step forward into what God has got for you, to step aside and let Lord lead your life, to, to step up and be the man or the woman that God has called you to be, to, to take courage and take a hold of courage as we go into 2019. I was only eight when the gun went off for the 1968 a marathon race, which the Olympic marathon race took place in Mexico City. And I remember being in my aunt's uh, living room because she had a color TV. We didn't have a color TV. And I went to look at the Olympics, and it was the last one of the, the Olympic Games. And the marathon, the gun went off, and the 75 runners took off around the, the marathon, 26.2 mile marathon race. And as they, they went round, one of them was a guy called John Stephen Aquari, who was a Tanzanian, one of four Tanzanians that were sent to the Olympic Games to come home with gold medals. None of them did, but his story is an amazing story because they all took off around that track. But at 13 miles, there was a pileup, and they all, a lot of them, 18 were taken out of the race. J John Stephen Aquari was one of them. He fell, and he, he dislocated his shoulder, I beg your pardon, he bruised his shoulder. He would gashes all over the place, and he dislocated his kneecap, and he was advised by the, the medic at the side of the track, John, you can't continue running. He said, I need to continue running. And so they strapped up his kneecap and put a, a strapping on, and off he went. A guy, an Ethiopian guy, uh, won, won the race, and he, he, he came home and got the, the glory. And actually, the race was almost at an end, and everybody was beginning to go home. It was now an hour after the, the winner, a guy called Momo a. Woldy, had, run, had won the race. He, he run, and we're now an hour late, and the, people, the lights were going down, and people were leaving. And into the stadium comes this lone runner to start his final 800 meters as he went round. The television crews came back and all the people came back and they, they began watching and standing and cheering as this lone runner started round the last track. And as he finished and, and completed an hour after the, the first guy had won, everybody stood and clapped for John Stephen Aquari. And the people asked, why did you continue? Why did you not step aside? Why did you not just finish the race when you dislocated your kneecap and when you bruised your shoulder? He said, my country didn't send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles to complete the race. And what a challenge for us. Yeah, it's a great story. And what a challenge for us, actually, because we often hear that it's not how we start our race, it's how we stop our race, how we end it. But actually, how we stop our race depends on how we stay in the race. And for each of those stages, for starting the race, for running the race, and for finishing the race, you and I need courage. We need that secret ingredient that adds to our faith and that puts us into action. We need courage to l take wh what we believe and put it into process. We need courage to be who God has called us to be at every stage of our journey. And this morning, we just wanted to finish off this story as we finish in Joshua chapter 14. It's a great story there. They're realizing that we need to know that it takes courage to step out again and again. It takes courage at every stage of our lives. It takes courage to step out again. So where, where we're at is that in chapter 13, it's got this sad story. We, you remember Tom took us to uh, where we were last week, where the, the land had rest from war and how the, the nation, the, the, the whole land now was spread apart and set out uh, for all the, the Israelites. But in chapter 13, verse 1, it says, When Joshua was old and well advanced in years, the Lord said to him, You're very old. And there are still very large areas of the land to be taken over. I hope that God never comes to you and me and says, you're very old and there's still much of the, the land that I had promised you that you haven't occupied. Maybe he says to you where you're at today, you're getting on and the years are increasing. They're not getting less. The years are increasing. And there's still as much of what I'd promised for your life that you haven't arrived at yet. There's still much inheritance that he has available for you that you haven't walked into yet. And again, he wants to say to you and me today, it's time to take courage, to take everything that God has for us and to step into everything that he's promised for you and for me. And we get this wonderful story of this guy, Caleb, and it's in chapter 14, and it's up on the screen if you don't have your phone with you. 
or even a Bible, but we're going to read from chapter, verse 6 and chapter 14. It says, now the men, the, the, uh, sorry, it starts and says, now the, men, the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought back a report, <clears throat> I brought back a report based upon according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people sink. I, however, followed the, my, the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day Moses swore to me, the land in which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly." Now then, just as the Lord promised, He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time He said this to Moses, So while, the Isra while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there, and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. Then Joseph blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. It's a fabulous story of this man, now 85, who's beginning to walk and step into that which was his promised inheritance. And for us in this room today, I believe that God wants to encourage us again and challenge us again that there's more available for each one of us. There's more that is sitting waiting for you and me to grab a hold of the courage and step out again into what He's got for you. Some of us have arrived at where we think is the end point. Some of us have arrived at where we think this is the sum of our lives. I want to encourage you today that God has got more for every one of us in this room today. He's got more for everyone, whether you're sitting in the balcony, whether you're sitting down here, He's got more for every one of us, but it involves you and I taking courage again and stepping out once again. There's four simple things I want to, to remind you about and encourage you about from this story. Four observations about this guy, Caleb. Four stages in his life, and all of us may well be at different stages in, as, as Caleb was in his life all at different points in the journey that God wants to speak to you today. He's got a word for you today from each one of those, these points. And number one is it takes courage to step out into the limelight. It's courage to step out into the limelight. It's time to be visible. You see, this guy, Caleb, shouldn't have been there. Back in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 is the story where, the, where Moses chose 12 spies to go out and to spy the land. They were staying in a little town called Kadesh Barnea on the border. And Moses said, I, I've, I've got you 12, each one representing one of the tribes, and you're going to go in and spy out the land. And you're going to tell me, come back with a report, tell me what the place looks like, who lives there, how we're going to take it, how's it going to be, where we're going to live, what are the food that is there, what are the people like that are there, what are the obstacles like. You're going to come back and tell us, and then we're going to go in. And you know the story, 12 spies went to Cain, and da -da, 10 were good, and 2 were, you know, 10 were bad, and 2 were good. Yeah, keep, keep me right, keep the theology right. And we're we all, know that, that we all know that story. And Caleb was one of those that came back. But the, the, the reality is Caleb shouldn't have been on those 12. He shouldn't have been chosen. The Bible, and we wrote it, wrote, read it together right at the very beginning, it says Caleb was the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite. You see, the Kenizzites weren't even part of Israel. The Kenizzites were from the tribe, of, from the family of Esau, Jacob, or Israel's brother. And Caleb shouldn't have even been there. Caleb shouldn't have been among the ones that were the leaders that were sent out to spy. Caleb didn't have the, the credentials and the qualifications. He didn't have the pedigree. He wasn't part of the in-group. He wasn't, shouldn't have been one of the ones that was called to step out of the shadows and become visible so the whole country could see who he was. Sometimes we live in the shadows all our lives because we don't think we deserve to be where God wants us to, who is going to use us. Because of the things that are going on in our lives and in our hearts, we think we don't deserve to be called by God. 
We think because of what we've done in our past, we shouldn't be part of that visible group that, that say that we're Christians, that actually have something to give and something to offer. And we live in the shadows all our lives. And I want to encourage you today, it takes courage to step out of the shadows and step into the limelight and become visible for the people that are around. Moses saw something in, jo in Caleb as a leader and an influencer. Moses saw something in him and said, you'll go. He's 40 years he'd grown up in, in slavery. He shouldn't have been there. But you see, I believe that, that Caleb had, had mastered two challenges. The challenge of identity. His name actually means dog. You know, for us, we're a dog-loving nation. And look after dogs, groom dogs, feed dogs, get fat dogs, walk dogs, wash dogs, do everything with dogs. You know, you know it's like a dog hospital, dog cemetery. I mean, if you're a dog lover, praise God, that's fine. fine. But... but but, you know, we live in a society that loves dogs. That's not how it was here. Dogs were animals that you kicked. Dogs were animals that were, were not kept in your tent. Dogs were kind of crazy animals that you, you abused and stuff. His name means dog. Imagine his father calling him dog. But that's what Caleb means. It means dog. It's a derogatory term. We don't know why. We don't know the history. Caleb shouldn't have been part of that group that were sent. But you see, he'd courage to step out into the limelight because he'd nailed what his, his identity was not based upon his pedigree. It was not based on where he came from. It was not based upon the tribe that he was part of. It was based on what God saw in him. His, his identity was not based on the name that was given to him. It was not based on whatever people called him. It was not based on what people thought of him. It was not based upon what the popular opinion was of him. It was not based on what his parents said of him. It was based upon what God thought of him. And for you and me today, we need to get a sense and courage of that in the midst of all the stuff that's going on around us. What you may feel are the things that exclude you. What are the things that, that you see, I could never be visible for what God wants to do. I could never step into the limelight. I could never be one of those that God would actually choose. You need to get courage within you today to know that that's not who you are. I don't care what has gone on in your past. God has got a different future for you, and it's His plans and His purpose, and it's the limelight that He was looking for you. It was more than that for Caleb. It was not only he, he'd nailed the challenge of identity, he'd nailed the challenge of availability. He'd made himself available to be used by God. He'd stepped out of the shadows, out of the two million, and said, I'll be one of those. If you want me to go, I'll be the one to go. If you, want, if you call me out, I'll be the one to respond. God is looking to call out people in this room again and again and again. All throughout 2019, He's looking to call you out. Have you got that sense of who you are in God? And have you also got that sense of, I'm available? Or is it, I'm available if? I'm available when? I'm available in my terms, on my grounds, on, on how I want it to be. Don't interrupt with this time in my life. Don't interrupt with that thing in my life. I'm available when I want to be available, not when you want me. I, th I love it that Caleb had got the courage to step out of the shadows and into the limelight to become visible because he had an understanding of who he was and an understanding that God wanted to use him. You know what? All the things that you and I do, the highest calling in our life is to be used by God, is to serve His purposes, is to serve what he wants to do. Caleb had got an understanding. You know, in Exodus 3 and, and verse 8, it tells the story of how uh, uh, God had a, com a conversation with Moses. And the people had been crying, God, help us. Please help us. Do something in our lives and change our situation, change our circumstances. Maybe a prayer like some of you have prayed to God. God, please, that you would hear my cries, that you would respond to the challenges in my life. And God responded and he said to Moses, Moses, I have come down to rescue the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Hallelujah. To set free from the circumstances they found themselves in. To set them free from the bondage that they were in. To set them free from everything that had been in the last several hundred years set them free. How wonderful is that? But he doesn't stop there. He goes on and says, to, and to bring them up and out of the land and into a good and spacious land. God has set you free, not to set you free. He set you free to be who he's called you to be. It's not for just setting you free and say, thank you for our salvation, where we, as we do when we come around communion together. But it's actually set you free to be who he's called you to be. It's time to take courage to step out into the limelight as Caleb did. It's time actually to step up, up and into the spotlight. It's not just about being visible, it's about being vocal. Time to step up and into the spotlight. 
for all of us in the room today, there's a moment to stand out from the crowd. There's a moment that God is calling you and me to stand out from the crowd. These were two men against a million. Two men to stand out from the crowd and declare what they believed in God and what they believed God had said to them to say. They'd all spent six weeks walking around uh, Israel. They'd all spent six weeks looking at the same things. They'd all spent six weeks observing all the stuff, observing giants, observing wonderful produce, observing the hills and the, and the valleys, observing everything. They'd spent six weeks all together looking at the same stuff, but they hadn't spent six weeks seeing the same stuff. They may have observed the same stuff and they may have looked at the same stuff, but they didn't see the same stuff. Why? Because I believe that it was a moment for Caleb to rise up and take courage to step into the spotlight to be the one that was vocal. You see, sometimes the challenge for us is when the collective around us is so strong, when the community around us is so strong, when the culture in which we find ourselves to conform is so strong, we say the same and we be the same and we become the same. I don't know. From Monday to Saturday, we live in a different environment. It's wonderful when we come to this safe place. I love, that's part of church for me, as we come together as the family of God, we get built up again, we declare our praise to Him. We talk to him and he talks to us. We open up our hearts again. We remember what he's done for us. But actually, as believers in Jesus Christ, as fully devoted followers, it's what happens when we go outside those doors. And when the pressure is on and fun, when conformity is, is strong for us, which voice are we listening to? What is the voice in our head at those times? What are the ones that we're stepping out with? Who are the ones that you're stepping with? You see, 10 of the, his colleagues saw the same stuff. Ten saw the same thing, and yet they came back with a different story because collectively they were stepping together. You know, when you need to watch who you step out with. Be, be careful who you're stepping with as you go through life. If you're stepping with those full of negativity, then can I encourage you and, and challenge you that that's going to end up in co being contagious. Negativity is always contagious. People that you hear constantly. If you go back to Numbers and chapter 14, it says that when they came back and told the people, the people were sad. But then in chapter 14, verse 1, that night it says, all the people. From 10 people, it becomes all the people. Negativity is always contagious. Be so careful in who you're stepping out with, because sometimes it can be contagious. It can all, all, it's always constraining, because it always says what we can't do. It never says what we can do. Negativity is always constraining. It says, when Caleb said, he silenced the people, and he says, we should go up and take the possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. And the answer in verse 31 says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack. Negativity will always say we, what we can't do. It's trust and faith in God with a, mixed up with courage that says, this is what we can do through him who strengthens us. Be careful who you step out with. But you see, I love the the truth that it says about in, in chapter 14, and we're reading there, when God said to, to, Josh, uh, to Caleb, but Caleb, you have a different spirit. You've a different spirit on you. You're not the same as those that are around. You, you carry something different. You carry something that is unique to you. You carry something about your attitude, about your motives, about your purpose, about your mindset, about your demeanor, about how you lean in. You're a different man from those that are around. And that's what it takes for you and me. It takes you and I to have a different spirit up, up, upon you and I because we follow the Lord wholeheartedly. That's what it says. Caleb, you're different. You have a different spirit on you because you follow me wholeheartedly. If you and I want to step out and into the spotlight and become vocal about our faith when we need those things, we need a different spirit on us. What does that look like for you and for me? Well, I believe it's about having a revelation of who God is. Caleb had an understanding that what God said was always more important, what, the, the, what God was saying was, always, was more important than the giants he was seeing. That what God was declaring in him and through him and seeing through his eyes was always more important than the circumstances. What is the loudest voice in your head? Is it the circumstances? Is it the comfort? Is it the, the ease with which you want to live life? Or is it what God is saying? Is it what God is calling you to? What is the loudest voice in your head? For Caleb, the loudest voice was always who he knew, what, not what he saw. The loudest voice for me, was a, as, for us, has got to be that revelation. It says there, 
you know, he said to, had a conversation with Joshua, and he says, uh, Joshua, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. Oh, I love that. What has God said about you today? What do you know that God has said about you today? Do you know that he said that you're forgiven? Does he, do you know that you, he said that there's no conde- condemnation to those that love Jesus? Do you know that he said that it's you that he's looking for, that you are the apple of his eye? Do, do you know that he said he's never ever going to leave you or forsake you? Do you know that he said he's placed a gift within you called the Holy Spirit? Do you know that he's placed things within you that only you can do? Do you know that he's got a future for you and a purpose for you that only you can fulfill? Do you know that he's already set things apart, gifts and, and jobs and stuff that only you can do? Do you know what he said about you already? That wonderful revelation. When you get a revelation of who God is and what He said about you, then it builds the why of your life so strongly inside. Why you do what you do, why you do, why you go where you go, why you walk with who you walk with. It's because you've got a revelation of what God has said about you. But if you don't have that, you do what you want to do and you go where you want to do, go. But once we get a revelation of God, we take on a different spirit because we do what He wants to do and we pursue what He wants us to pursue. It's not only about a revelation, it's also about the conviction in our hearts. When we get to open our eyes to see who God really is and what He really thinks about us, what He really knows about us, and once we know that, that's that conviction. He came back and said, I gave them a report not according to the circumstances. I gave them a report not according to my feelings. I gave them a report not according to what everybody else was saying. I gave them a report not because there was somebody there pushing me to say something. He said, I gave them a report according to my convictions, according to what was deep-seated confidence in God in my heart. It's an interesting term. It means the word as it was in my heart. I gave my report according to the word as it was in my heart. He would courage to step into the spotlight always needs you to have a conviction deep in your heart. He says, I followed the Lord full-heartedly, wholeheartedly. You know, it's not just about optimism. It's not just about positive thinking. It's not just about that keeping on things on the bright side. It's actually a conviction is the confidence we have in God that He is who He says He is, and He has done what He says He's done. It's shifting from our head into our hearts. And, and Caleb says, I followed the Lord half, eh, full, wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly, You see, we need to challenge ourselves today. Are we following the Lord half-heartedly? You know what half-heartedly following is? It's when you give a portion of your life. You don't give the whole portion. You just give a half portion. You give this time of your life, a Sunday morning for an hour, you give that chunk. Maybe a Wednesday night, you give that chunk. Maybe a a Thursday morning or something, you give that chunk. And you chunk your life out and you work your life with, in chunks and you give this bit available. That's not what Caleb was saying. Caleb was saying, I've got one life and I give it all for you, Lord. I give my life wholeheartedly for you. It's my whole life, not half-heartedly. For others, sometimes it's light-heartedly. It's, hey, whatever, huh? If when things are going great, I'm there, I'm praising God, my hands are up, I'm, I'm washing the windows, I'm having a great time. <laughs> I'm having a fantastic time. Everything's okay because my circumstances are great and the world is fantastic. But when the world is not fantastic and pain and anguish comes, then my light-hearted following of God disappears and I disappear. Oh, that you and I would be men and women who are wholeheartedly. When Caesar uh, arrived in the, and Julius Caesar arrived in the UK, they all arrived and parked their boats on the, uh, and down by Tom's home in, in a... Uh, Kent, and they parked their boats in the Kent coast, and the, 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 the Roman soldiers got up onto the, the, what's the land? the land called, and started walking, and, and Julius Caesar, it's time to turn around and see what's going on in your boats. And when he turned around, all the boats were aflame, because he said to them, there's no going back. It's only one direction. It's only up and conquering. It's only going forward. Sometimes we need to do that. We need to burn the boats that would take us back, plan B that would take us out when things get difficult. You and I need to to do that because the word means for you and me to to follow God wholeheartedly. If we're going to step into the spotlight, then we need to step in wholeheartedly. Step out of the shadows and into the limelight to be visible. Step up and into the spotlight that you and I would be vocal. 
And can you imagine the excitement as Caleb is coming back and saying, hey, we saw this fantastic place. Yes, there were some giants there that were living in a place called Hebron. I mean, they're going to be a bit of difficulty. We'll need two days instead of one to deal with them. I mean, hey, the land is fantastic. And we're going to go there. It's going to be amazing. Yes, come on. And around them are ten voices that say, we don't see what you see. And actually what we see is the reality. You don't see the reality. And the challenge, I think, for so many of us is that we need courage to stay when there's only a nightlight. Courage to stay when there's only a nightlight. See, what do I mean by that? Well, when I was a little kid, when I was a little kid, we always had a little nightlight in my room. It was enough to just dispel the darkness a bit, but it was never enough to light your way. You couldn't see where to go, but it just dispelled the darkness a little bit. Caleb could have easily slipped into the darkness, snuffed out the light in his life because of the circumstances, because the decisions around him could have taken away any courage. You know what happened? This was a major rejection for Caleb. What they were saying is, Caleb, we don't take your version. We don't want, want what you have. We don't like who you are. We don't see, see what you see. We don't actually like you. In, in Numbers it says that they actually thought about stoning him. Can you imagine what that level of rejection must have felt like for Caleb? You've got all this group of people that says, we don't like your report. We don't think you have got what it takes to deliver what needs to be delivered. We don't think that what you're saying actually can come true or the rejection that he must have felt. But I love what the antidote for all of us for rejection is. The antidote for rejection for all of us is before that you can say, you know what God said about you and me. Needs to be because I know what God said about you and me. Before you're able to tell anybody else, do you know what God said about us, Joshua? Caleb had to get to that place of saying, I know what God said about us. Once we get to that place, no matter what people say, then we know who we are in God. But for Caleb, sometimes if we, if we have that kind of level of difficulty that comes into our life and that div- level of rejection, you know what comes after that is that place of frustration. You know, he was 40 when he was sent out into the Israel to spy out the land. And for the next 38 years, he spent wandering in the wilderness. Oh, the frustration. Can you imagine the frustration of not arriving at the dream that he thought was in his heart? Can you imagine the frustration of not understanding why God's plan for his life hasn't outworked? Can you imagine the frustration of living out someone else's story? Somebody else sets the narrative of of Caleb's life, and he lives that out for for 38 years. Another year comes by, and another set of gray hairs. And another year comes by and somebody else dies of his friends. Another year goes by and still nothing happens. Still nothing towards the dream. He doesn't know that a a now give me this land day is going to come. He doesn't know there's going to be a different future. He doesn't know what the outcome is going to be. But every year frustration continues to build in his life. That the dream he once had of what his future was going to be washes away. That the dream of what he thought God had placed in his heart is gone. Can you imagine the frustration in Caleb's life? Maybe you're sitting in here today and you're living out that frustration, that the dream that you thought was going to be your future hasn't arrived, that the person you've married hasn't turned out to be the one you thought they were going to be, that the job that you're in isn't what you thought it was going to be, that the family that you don't have is not how you thought it would be, that everything that's around you wasn't how you expected it to be, and you're living in that place called frustration. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Caleb year after year after year that that was the reality? And so many times for so many people, That makes us slip into the darkness. We stop the race and we don't go forward. We need courage to keep on staying even when there's just a nightlight to take the edge off the darkness. You and I need to have all the courage we can to live through the frustration. You see, what I love about Caleb was he changed, he chose to turn the wilderness of frustration into the womb of incubation. Turn the wilderness of frustration into the womb of incubation for what God wanted to do. And can I say to you today in this room, there are some here and I know, you're living in that wilderness of frustration where you're not even in the limelight, let alone be in the spotlight. Where that which you thought was your dream dream looks as though it's died. Where what you thought was going to be your future hasn't emerged and hasn't translated into reality. Then don't 
continue to live in the wilderness of frustration, allow God to change that into the womb of incubation, that He will bring forth a fresh birth from you of a brand new dream. You need courage to do that. You need courage at every stage. You need courage to step into the limelight. You need courage to step into the spotlight. You need courage to continue when all you've got is just a nightlight. And I believe that he did that. And he says very clearly here, you know, there's a bigger picture. God kept me alive. God has kept you alive. God has shaped your pattern of life. God has shaped the friends around you. God has shaped the very fact that you're in this place today. God has done all that because he's looking to incubate in you the plans and the purposes he has for you tomorrow. But all the time, I love the fact that Caleb continued just to persistently walk. He continued to persistently be there. He continued to walk with them. He didn't say, that's fine, I'm, going, I'm back. I'm going back over the river again. Back to my people, the Kenizzites. Let me leave you Israelites, and I'll go back to where my generations come from. No, he continued to walk, walk with them. Even though he was living out somebody else's narrative, even though he was living out somebody else's frustrating story, it wasn't his. He continued just to walk for 40 years. He continued. When it came time to fight, he fought fought. When it came time to, to go up mountains, he went up mountains. He was there all the time. Why? Because he had the courage to keep on going even when it was just a little night light. Because I love the fact that we come to where we come to. And we finally like at that last stage that you and I have today, courage to step forward again into the sunlight. Courage to step forward again into the sunlight. You know, it takes courage for all of us to get up again when we've put, been put down. It takes courage for all of us to rise again when we've been rejected. It takes courage again to move out of the frustration. And I love what you see in this man. He said, I am as strong as I ever was. I'm as passionate and vigorous as I ever was. It takes passion in your life. Keep the passion alive in your life. Keep the passion for Jesus going in your life. Don't let it cool down. Don't let it go down. You know, years increase, but I believe for when we see, look at Caleb, he gets younger every year. He doesn't get older every year. He gets younger. Sometimes we stop running because we get old. I wonder if it's because we stop running that we get old. I'm going to continue running till the last breath. I'm going to continue with the passion that I have and the vigor that I have for as long as I can. Because I believe it takes courage to continue running. Oh, the things, we fall and things dislocate our, our lives. We fall and we get disappointed. For, for Caleb, he got up and he was active again. I love that. It took courage for him to get going again. It takes courage for you and me to get going again. You see, God promises that he will do the driving. He will do the, the dealing with all the future. But it needed Caleb to be the one who took the mountain. It's both, isn't it? And for you and me today, God has made a fantastic future available for you. But what are you going to do? Are you Are going to sit back as we were reminded last week and think that God's going to do it? No. We need to step up and step in and be active and do what God wants you and me to do. I love how this story ends. It ends with an invitation for the next generation to join, an impartation to the next generation to say, you know what, be a, a generation that asks. Be a generation that keeps on asking. Be a generation that is willing to step up and, and fight. Be our generation, and that's for us to impart. Hey, we're done. My time is over this morning. Maybe you can remember where you felt the race was passing you by. Maybe you can remember where you dropped off the race. Maybe you can remember where you stopped running. Well, today, can I encourage you? Take courage again to build passion in your life. Time to ignite that passion in your life again. Time to, to run again with what God has placed in your heart and in your life. Don't stop running. Continue to run. Maybe you've fallen. Maybe you're sitting in here today with that rejection. Maybe somebody has done something, said something to you, and you're the one who's feels rejected, left behind. Disappointments, frustration, bitterness, negativity. Then today, take courage. Even though it's just a night light at the moment, the morning is coming. Sorrow lasts just the night time. Joy is coming for you in the morning. For some in here, 
Maybe you're at the place where you, the gun has just gone off. Maybe for you today is the time and the decision to follow Jesus. Let's bow our heads just for a moment as the band finish off today.